Hi, good morning, everybody. Welcome to a sunny, cold Tuesday morning of Chem 1105 with your host, me, Dr. White. All right, some important things. One, there won't be any class on Wednesday or Friday. It's holiday. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, this Thanksgiving, I'm not going to go anywhere for a Thanksgiving meal. I didn't do the last because of the COVID, but this, I'm just not taking any chances because next Monday I'll have my other cataract surgery. I don't even want a chance of getting a cold or anything like that to postpone that surgery. So, but in the past, I don't know about your family, but in my family, the turkey isn't the only thing that gets stuffed. We all do. Oh, it's so good. But anyways, uh, in keeping with Thanksgiving this morning, just a little while ago, I had a great idea. And that is a number of you have not handed in the last couple of labs. And that will hurt you. So in keeping with Thanksgiving holiday, I am going to be posting later today an announcement. You'll get an email that I will be doing a Thanksgiving laboratory and uh, amnesty program. And for the last four labs, not the one that's due today, I will open up the assignment area on Blackboard so you can hand it in late. I'll take off one point uh, for it being late, but still you can get nine others if you get everything right. And therefore, and the deadline of that will be December 1st. And I'll send that out in an announcement and email later today, because I just thought of the idea. I think it's a good one too for a number of you who haven't handed in your last couple lab. All right, today we're gonna go a little later than normal. I'll still get you out early. I'll get you out before midnight. Kidding, way before midnight. So let's get to work. And as always, I haven't said this in a while, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Always feel comfortable to ask questions to me. All right, yesterday we were talking about general reactions in organic chemistry. And the first one I showed you was combustion. And that's where you take a saturated hydrocarbon, react it with oxygen. You need a spark, but I don't put it down there. And you get carbon dioxide, CO2, water, H2O, and heat. The actual chemicals are CO2 and water. And when we're doing a reaction like this, organic chemists don't balance it. See how nice organic chemistry is? Now, the next reaction I want to talk about is hydrogenation. And hint, you should know this reaction. And I'll explain why. And this is addition of hydrogen, H2 gas, I'll put that in there so you know I'm not talking about hydrogen atoms, to an alkene. An alkene is a carbon-carbon double bond. And you need what's called a catalyst. A catalyst is something that makes a reaction go quicker. Now, I haven't talked about it in this class. It's called kinetics, how fast reactions go. And reactions can be faster than that, or they can be very slow. The fastest of all reactions are called the fusion control reactions, where you mix two things together as soon as they mix, they react. Acid-base reactions are that quick. Now, there are other reactions that are real slow. One reaction I did at one company in their chemical plant that I supervised took, are you ready for this? From start to finish, 34 hours. It was slow, but it was also very lucrative. But one way to speed up a reaction is to add what's called a catalyst. And for this reaction, which I've done both in the lab and a chemical plant, 
when you take an R means like X and Y, this is a carbon-carbon double bond. And you add to it hydrogen and you use a catalyst, which can be platinum, palladium, or nickel. In industry, nickel is the cheapest, and that's what we use. And you then break the double one of the bonds of the double bond. I uh, won't ask on a test, but a double bond is made up of one pi bond and one sigma bond. Sigma bonds are very hard to break. Pi bonds, I can break like that. They're fun. And you break it, and each carbon of the double bond gets a hydrogen. And let me show it a better way. If you just have a double bond, but first I have to teach you something. Organic chemists are lazy. Up here, I have a reaction. A plus B plus C yields or makes D. Now, organic chemists are lazy, and sometimes we'll do the same thing like this. A plus B plus C makes D. And this is an example, hydrogen gas and a catalyst. Now catalyst is not consumed or used up in the reaction, you get it back. And here the catalyst can be nickel, platinum, or palladium. And you break the pi bond, remember there's one pi bond, one sigma bond, pi bonds I can break like that, sigma bonds I don't, the single bond between carbons, and each carbon gets a hydrogen. And this is called hydrogenation. So, Four points each give the product, or it could be more than one, but in this class won't, give the product or products four. And let's look at one. Now, if we look at this, the first thing you should do is look for what's different. What's not a carbon or hydrogen or carbon, carbon, single bond should get your attention like that, actually faster. And if we look right here, it's a double bond. So how do we do this reaction? You have memorized, hint, this general reaction, double bond, Hydrogen and catalyst, catalyst can be nickel, platinum, or palladium to break the pi bond, and both carbons of the double bond get a hydrogen. All other carbon carbon single bonds you don't break. You don't break carbon carbon single bonds. So the general reaction double bond, hydrogen, and a catalyst, which we abbreviate CAT. And the catalyst can be nickel, platinum, or palladium. And you break the pi bond, one of the bonds is a double bond, and each carbon gets a hydrogen. So we have one, two, three carbons. We're going to end up with three carbons because you don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds. And I broke the pi bond. You can see there's only one line, not two. And each carbon of the double bond gets a hydrogen. Now there are four bonds to carbon. So I can put in the remainder hydrogens. This is one, two, three. Four minus three is that. This is one, two. Four minus two is two. Now you could have also written it this way. I 
I just brought this up here, this up here. However, this is an extra step and this is easier for students. And since I'm grading the test, I like to make it easier for students. So this is called hydrogenation. You break the double bond and add two hydrogens, one hydrogen to each carbon of the double bond. And now it's your turn to have some fun. Give the product or products for the following reaction in B. Oh, I have a question for everybody. I'll, after we do this problem, I'll ask the question. All right, let's take a look at this. Well, first of all, I should really do this. All right, looks like some of you are having difficulty. So let me do this one for you. What's different? What's not a carbon or hydrogen atom or carbon, carbon, single bond, one line. And if we look at the molecule I just drew, a double bond, two lines. So what's the reaction we have? When you see a functional group, you ignore everything else. A double bond, I have hydrogen gas, and this is my catalyst, which I'll abbreviate CAT, period. And the catalyst can be nickel, which in this case it is, palladium or platinum. And you break the one of the bonds, the double bond, and each carbon of the double bond gets a hydrogen. Well, I have one, two, three, four carbons. I better end up with four carbons. You don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds. There are fewer reactions that do. Combustion is an example, but they're very rare. Here are my two carbons of the double bond. Each carbon will now get a hydrogen. And notice I broke one of the bonds because that's what hydrogen hydrogenation does. And now I know there are four bonds to carbon. Oh, that's the ugliest H I've ever, I don't know about ever, but at least today, let's try this again. And that's the product you get. Oh, let's do one more. And here's one more for you to try.
All right, I'm gonna put out a poll, new poll. It will ask, are you done? But I'm gonna change, not on the screen, but ask you in your mind to change. Are you having problems with this? When I send this, the question is, not are you done? Are you having problems with this? this is totally anonymous. So answer yes, you're having problems. No, you're not. All right, looks like most of you got it, but let's do it. Look at this molecule, look for what's different. What's not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbon-hydrogen atom should get your attention. And here we have two lines, double bond. And what are we reacting to double bond? As soon as I see the functional group double bond, that's all I see in my head and I'm reacting with hydrogen, nickel is a catalyst. And other catalysts besides nickel can be platinum or palladium. But in industry, we don't use that because those are very expensive. And you break one of the bonds and each carbon of the double bond gets a hydrogen. Now you don't break carbon-carbon single bonds. So notice I have here four across plus this coming down. This is called the methyl group. You were to take organic chemistry with me. And notice I broke one of the pi bonds. Here there are two, here there's only one. And to these two carbons, I'm gonna add a hydrogen to each one. And the rest of them just came along for the ride because they were attached. And now I know there's four bonds to carbon so I can put in the hydrogens. And that's how you do it. Now I'm gonna do one more, I'll do it. And the question is, what's the, or what's the product or products for the following? And first of all, I'm gonna look at the molecule right here and say, what's different? What's not a carbon or hydrogen atom or a carbon-carbon single bond, one line? And I see, oh, two lines, that's a double bond. And I'm reacting it with hydrogen, and a catalyst. And the catalyst here is nickel. It could be platinum or it could be palladium. And you break one of the bonds of the double bond. So there's only one line and each carbon of the double bond, which is no longer a double bond, gets a hydrogen. So if you notice I have one, two, three, four, five carbons. I better end up with this reaction, five carbons. Notice here, I have two lines, but because I break the bond, one of the bonds, I only have one line. And each carbon that was of the double bond gets a hydrogen. And now I know there are four bonds to carbon. So this first carbon has two already, so it needs two more. The second carbon has three lines or bonds, four minus three, one. This is four minus two, four minus two, that's a hydrogen, and one, four minus one, three. And that's how you do it. Now the question is, why learn this? Well, how many of you have, and give me a thumbs up if you have, 
How many of you have ever heard of hydrogenated fats or oils? I see at least one of you have, so a couple of you have. And medical science has told us a lot of you have. It's not good for us, but why is it out there? Well, hydrogenated fats and oils, especially vegetable oils, have a double bond in the molecule. And if you add hydrogen, you make it into a single bond. So what? Well, the vegetable oil with the double bond is a liquid at room temperature. The one where you get rid of the double bond called hydrogenating a fat or oil is this liquid at room temperature. What am I saying? Ah, got it backwards. Is a solid or semi solid at room temperature. Now, most fats and oils are almost water white or very slightly yellow, very slightly. Well, if I take that now solid and I add some water, some yellow food coloring, and some flavoring, mix it up, I can sell it to you as margarine. And the vegetable oil I bought was cheap. But the margarine I sell you is expensive, and I'll make a lot of money. In fact, I didn't work in that division, but years ago I worked for Unichemic Chemicals, which was part of Unilever, which sold. I remember when they first started making it. I can't believe it's butter, butter. Actually, I can't believe it's butter margarine, and. Uh, that's hydrogenated fats and oils, which is bad for your heart, but they make money. They don't care about your heart. Now, before we go on, I have a quick question for all of you. And if you want, you can email me the answer. We go to my YouTube channel for 1105, if you look on the top line all the way to the left, the 2021 20, 1115 file has 79 views. Now, am I giving away the secret how to make gold from lead in that video or why is it so popular? I mean, it talks about pH and stuff like that. And I don't think I give you my bank account numbers or anything. So if you could send me an email, why it's so popular, I'd appreciate it because I have no idea, but I'm becoming a YouTube star. 79 views, amazing. Now, when it comes to these general reactions, I'm only gonna ask you to learn two, two. When I teach organic chemistry, I think the count is about 50. I personally know about 400 to 450 of these. There are many more. Do I know all of them? No. But do I know the ones where I've worked in those areas and still consult? You better believe it. All right, let's move on. Now, when we talk about organic chemistry, where do we find this in your daily life? And I thought I'd teach you some basics. Fats and oils are organic chemistry. Carbohydrates are organic chemistry. Proteins are organic chemistry. And something which we'll do in the lab later today, polymers are organic chemistry. And let's talk about fats and oils. Now, fats and oils are known as triglycerides, and the functional group in there is an ester. Now, you see the term triester? That means not one, not two, but three. Tri means three. And all fats and oils have this structure. You don't have to learn this, but I thought I'd share it with you. This is an industry I've worked heavily in. Yeah. 
And I see a question. All right, thank you. I didn't know if there was a test review in that one. I thought it was the one before, but I'll take a look. It sure is popular. Thank you, Spencer. All right, each one of these functional groups is called the nester. And in your fats and oils, all fats and oils have this structure, except what are our prime and our double prime, like X, Y, and Z, the number of carbons is different for different fats and oils. And that's the main reason. Also, there can be a double bond or not double bond in our, our prime, our double prime. Now, something I won't ask on a test, but you should know, what's a fat? That's a triglyceride, that's a solid or semi-solid at room temperature. Room temperature, 25 degrees C, I think that's 77 degrees F. What's a semi-solid? If you've ever had a stick of butter sitting on the table for a while and you stick your knife in there, or when you're a little kid, you stuck your finger in there, it's sort of squishy, but it's still not liquid. That's a semi-solid. So fats are solids or semi-solids. Oils are liquid, a triglyceride, that triester I showed you, at room temperature. Now, there are different types of fat. I'm going to ask you to learn two things, because I've worked with this. And these are important chemicals used in the United States and the world. Beef fat, fat from a beef, like if you cook the hamburger and the stuff left in the frying pan, that's the fat, is called tallow. Now, if you cook bacon in a frying pan and the fat left behind is pig's fat, because bacon comes from pig. Now, there's two types of pig's fat, yellow grease and white grease. And I worked for a company and between tallow, white grease, and yellow grease, we purchased and used about 2 million pounds a week. Yes, 2 million pounds a week of tallow and yellow and white grease. And what you don't know, but I do is, those are so important chemicals on Friday in the Wall Street Journal every Friday, and also, in a weekly magazine called the Chemical Marketing Reporter, CMR, they give the price in the United States uh, in, from FOB New York, meaning if you bought it in New York, for white grease, yellow grease, and tallow. They also do gold, silver, cocoa, other commodities. And many of the things you use in your personal life the chemicals are made from reacting fats to make other chemicals, to make other chemicals that you use. Your fabric softener comes from tallow, but it's not really, by the time you get it, it's been purified and reacted to other chemicals. Your skin cream lotions come from chemicals made from fats and oils. Uh, one company I worked at, Unichemo, one of our better customers was Neutrogena. And we also sold to other personal care companies. And Neutrogena has had, when I worked there, very high. And I think they do standard of purity that they buy chemicals for their products, which is also why they charge a little more. Now, there are other fats and oils, coconut oil, soybean oil, corn oil, olive oil. Then there's this rapeseed oil. And if you go to Europe or India or China or other places throughout the world, people who are, uh, how should I say this politely, uh, who are being careful with their money, use rapeseed oil to cook with just like we use vegetable oil. Now, years ago, they tried selling rapeseed oil in the United States. 
and the American housewife, who's quite a smart person. Uh, I learned that through Procter and Gramble working with them. But anyways, wouldn't buy a product called rapeseed oil. Ah, I'm not going to buy that. Well, a lot of the rapeseed oil comes from a plant called the rape seed plant or rape plant. I don't know. I'd say on my knowledge of agriculture, but a lot of it comes from Canada. And there was a group of growers association and they hired someone marketing sales and he came up or she came up with a great idea. Let's see, Americans won't buy rapeseed oil because of the name. Eh. Well, it comes from this oil comes from Canada and it's an oil. Let's call it canola oil. And if you go in your local supermarket, you can buy it easily. And now they start selling a lot of it because it's less expensive than other oil, vegetable oils or olive oil especially. And that's how it got its name, canola oil, because Americans wouldn't buy rapeseed oil. Now, here's something important. When you react a fatter oil with acid and water, you get what's called fatty carboxylic acids, or they're really called fatty acids, plus glycerin. And this is what happens in your stomach. I don't want to scare you, but your stomach is a mobile chemical factory. And the fatter oil reacts with what acid is in your stomach, hydrochloric acid, and water. And this makes fatty acids, which your body uses to store energy. I'm not sure what it does with the glycerin. Switches off here, but I'm just giving you some background in organic chemistry. So that's what happens. Now, important thing switches on. If it only went to 10, a dial. I just turned it to a thousand. One of the things I would like you to do this semester is know how soap works. And soap and other molecules are called surface active agents. And that's been shortened to surfactants. And surfactants play a major role in many areas of our daily life. But today I'd like to talk to you about how does soap work? Now, soap has a structure, a reaction product of fatty acids is a bar soap. And soap, and this you should know, the structure of soap I better be subtle. I even put it on the slide. So the structure you should know has a long carbon tail and what's called a polar head. And this is a nonpolar tail. And it has a polar head. And sometimes the tail is called lipophilic. I won't ask you that. And the head is called hydrophilic. Lipo meaning fat loving, phyl loving. Hydro water, phyl, philic means loving, water loving. Now, the most important thing of the puzzle, how soap works, and you should know this, is like dissolves. light. This is the most important thing of the puzzle, how soap works. And I taught you light dissolve light, things that are polar are soluble in polar things, things that are nonpolar are soluble in nonpolar things. 
and the two you can't mix together. Well, water is polar, probably the most polar substance in the universe. And then what are you trying to clean? Dirt. Yeah, dirt you have to think about as a chemical or grease. And these are nonpolar. And this you should know. Now, if I have a piece of dirt on my hand right here, let's magnify it. Highly, I have a piece of dirt. And if I just try water, and if that was grease too, or just dirt or grease or greasy dirt, which I heard once in a commercial, I started laughing. Oh, that's classic. Water looks at dirt and says, I know light dissolves light. I'm polar, you're non-polar. I want no part of you. But now if you use soap and water, the soap has a non-polar tail and a polar head. And the soap looks at dirt and says, oh, my tail is non-polar. Dirt, you're non-polar. Let me set up like this. Well, a lot of molecules do that of soap. And it actually surrounds this 360 degrees with molecules of soap where the nonpolar tail is attracted to the dirt because of light dissolves light, but the polar head wants to stay far away from dirt because light dissolves light. And what this is, when it forms around the dirt, you should know. This is called a micelle. And now a micelle, and let me show you a picture of one. This is what micelles look like. A part of it has been cut out. In the very center right here is the little piece of dirt. And then these squiggly lines are the nonpolar tail of the soap. And then the minus blue is the polar head. And there's a cation there too, which I haven't talked about. And these are my cells. Oh, it even says know this here. Now, water looks at the my cell and only sees the polar heads. And now water says, I'm polar, my cell, you're polar, let's go down the drain together. And they do. And that's how you get your hands clean. That's how you get your dishes clean. That's how you get your clothes clean. That's how you get your car, if you wash your car recently clean. You form my cells. And the my cells are this structure where the dirt particles in the very center and all around it are the polar heads, which make water think, oh, you're polar by cell, I'm polar, let's go down the drain together. And they do, <laughs> I like that, and they do. So you should know that. Let's go through this again. So, you should know the structure of soap. If I ask on a test, eight to 10 points, how does soap work? Hint, show the structure of soap and explain how it works and talk about my cells. And here we have a nonpolar tail soap and it has a polar head. Now, uh, the, something made from fatty acids is your bar soap. Next time you use a bar soap, it's this. Also, your liquid soap is similar to this, too. That you use out of the pump. All right. Soap has a nonpolar tail, polar head. The most important part of the puzzle you should know is light 
the Zhao's life. And because of that, you need to remember water is polar, grease and dirt are nonpolar. And because of that, dirt being nonpolar, it attracts the nonpolar tail of soap when you use soap and water. The polar head doesn't want to be near the dirt because the light dissolves light and it stays far outside. And this whole thing is called a micelle. And when the micelle is formed, water only sees the polar heads of the micelle. And it says, oh, I'm polar, micelle, you're polar, let's go down to drain together. And they do. And you should know how soap works. Now, how am I doing time-wise? Not bad. A number of years ago, a student in my organic chemistry class came to me and showed me this ad. And on the ad, it had a product called Garnier Micellular Water. And it's good at cleaning your skin and soothing it. Now it's good product, so my students tell me, but here's the interesting thing. There are no micelles in my cellular water. There's soap and other chemicals. And once you put it on your face, then you make my cells. <laughs> but I, I thought it was quite clever for them to use a organic chemistry term for what happens when soap water and dirt, or if you have some grease like, or oil, oily skin, when you put it on there, how it cleanses it by making micelles. And that's why I think they call it micellular water, but there are no micelles in micellular water. It's always a joke I have to chuckle at, which I am doing now. And if we look at this, you see all these, and it's been quite popular. There are a number of companies that made it. Well, when the student came to me and I looked at the ingredients, and let's look at this list. Well, my cell is water, and the other one is surfactants, which are called soap, but they also have other things. Trying to find if I can find the other. Ah, nope. Usually I can find it. But, anyways, that's what's in my cellular water. But once again, you should know soap has a nonpolar tail polar head. Remember the key to how this works, and this is very important, is like dissolves like. Water is polar, dirt and grease, or oil on your face too, if you have oily skin, which I do at times, is nonpolar. And that's why you can't clean your face, your hands with water alone. You need soap. And the dirt attracts the soap such that the nonpolar tail lines up near the dirt and the polar head is on the outside of far away from the dirt. And this whole thing, dirt with the soap molecules surrounding it, you should know is called the micelle. And when water looks at the micelle, it only sees the polar heads and the water says now, micelle, you're polar, 
I'm polar. Let's go down the drain together. And they do. And this morning when I took my shower, I was thinking about today's lecture and saying, I'm probably the only one in Northern Illinois right now who's thinking, oh, when I'm using a soap of water and take my shower, I'm making my cells. And that's how I get the dirt and oil off my body. So I'm now nice and clean. Let's see how much time we have. Let's take a break right now. I'm gonna go a little longer because Wednesday and Friday, we're not gonna have class and next Monday, and I'll send out an email because my upcoming cataract surgery, we won't have live class, but I will post the video. And with that, why don't you come back at 9.55 and we'll continue with today's Chem 1105. I get up and take a five minute break and stretch. And when I have longer class like that, I do about 50 minutes, we take a break, we come back. I'll see you in five, 9.55, uh, see you in five.
Oh no, I'm running late. Sorry about that. Time to get going again, or I can use this one. Time to get going. One of the nice things about organic chemistry is, and then organic, but more organic, but I'm biased, I'm an organic chemist, is how many different places it plays an important role in our life. Now, I have a small one. This is a towel. And if your hands are wet, you go like this, and they're dry. And You can use a paper towel too, and the same thing happens. If your hands are wet or your face or other places, you can just go like this and by magic, the water comes off your hands or your face or whatever. It's not magic, it's organic chemistry. How does that happen? You should know the following. How does a towel work? Now, here's the structure of cotton. And I don't expect you to learn this or anything, but see where you see an oxygen, a hydrogen, and a carbon? That's called the hydroxyl group. And there are a lot of them in cotton. And these can hydrogen bond to water. And that's how a towel works. A towel works by hydrogen bonding to water, and that's how it removes the water from your skin or other places when you use a towel or paper towel. And you should know that. How does a towel work? hydrogen bonds to water. Now, one of the things, because I've worked in the industry, I actually have patents, is fabric softeners, which I use. By the way, uh, the fabric softeners on the sheets work much better than when you pour the liquid into your washing machine. You get more of the molecule fabric softener on there. Now, if you have older towels, you'll find oh, they don't work as well as when they were brand new. What's wrong? Well, if you've been using a fabric softener, which I do, that builds up on the towel and other things too, and blocks the hydrogen bonding. So how do you get a towel back to normal? It's called in industry, we call that rewet. How do you improve the rewet of a towel? You wash it once or twice and don't use a fabric softener. And that removes any of the fabric softener from the towel and it can hydrogen bond again. Then you can start using a fabric softener again. So you should know how does a towel work? It works by hydrogen bonding to the water. Ooh, that reminds me. How many of you have ever heard of the fact that, and I just remembered something I didn't do, bad Dr. White. Uh, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, now I got it. How many of you have ever heard that certain fabrics breathe? No, they don't breathe like, no, what they mean is the term breathe really means they hydrogen bond to water and they wick off the moisture. Uh, for women, it's called perspiration. For men, it's called sweat. But that's what they mean by breathe. And back when I was in oh late high school, early college, there was the big disco thing. Eh, I wasn't into it. But the clothing was all made of fabrics that wouldn't hydrogen bond, wouldn't breathe. And you felt like you were in a uh, rubber suit 
and it was ah. <laughs> my mother went out when I was in high school and got me a nice uh, uh, suit and uh, shirts and pants, and they were all this fabric. And all you do would be uh, sweating them when it, <laughs> when the uh, craze was over. I asked my mother, you mind if I do this? She said, no, go ahead. I know you don't like it. I donated all those clothes to the Salvation Army so someone else could suffer in them. But that's what they mean by clothing sweating. Now, one thing I forgot to do, and now I've got to open it up because I for this machine, I didn't have an up. The newer version. I apologize. Be with you in a second. All right. Now, if you look at the active course file, which I have my syllabus, I'm supposed to talk about biochemistry. So let's talk about it. It's really organic chemistry, but let's talk about this. And when we talk about biochemistry and thumbs up people, do you see biochemistry on your screen right now? Uh-oh, thank you, Spencer. And this will never be on a test or a final, but what's biochemistry? That's the study of chemical substances, molecules found in things that are alive and also the chemical interactions, otherwise known as reactions of substances in your body or things. Now, one of the things that happens and always astounds me is people think, well, if these are in your body, something different is happening. No, functional group chemistry, a double bond reacts like double bonds, whether it's in your body or not. Uh, Functional group chemistry for organic molecules occur just the same way in bio, for bioorganic molecules. In other words, the functional group chemistry going on in your body is the same as what happens in a laboratory or chemical plant. Just some of it's a lot more complex. Mother Nature is the greatest of all. Now, switch is off, but I just like to show you some stuff. Carbohydrates. What is a carbohydrate? A polyhydroxyaldehyde or polyhydroxyketone or compounds that yield such upon hydrolysis when you add water. So what's poly? Many. What's hydroxyl? OH. Aldehyde looks like this. And the same thing here, polyhydroxy, many OH, and a ketone looks like this. And people get confused with carbohydrates because they think just the starches when they say carbs, you're having a high carb diet. But it turns out sugars, 
which are also carbohydrates. And here are two of them, glucose and fructose. And this is called the Fisher projection, a way of showing the structure. And every intersectional line here is a carbon. And glucose is the most abundant sugar in nature. Fructose is the sweetest sugar in nature. Now this I'd like you to know, sucrose table sugar, that's glucose and fructose bonded together. Now, when you have starch, do I have a slide for that in here? I do, so let me, when you have table sugar called sucrose, In your stomach, you have hydrochloric acid and water, and it breaks it down to glucose plus fructose. And this you should know. And the question is why? Well, sucrose is the white stuff you put in your coffee, tea, or on your cereal, oatmeal, or whatever when you're cooking. And glucose and fructose are sugars also. And over the last 15, 20 years, organic chemists found a way in the chemical plant how to convert corn oil to high fructose corn oil, mainly fructose. So instead of using sucrose to sweeten something like your pop, for many years now, they've used fructose. Now, a number of years ago, and this is my personal opinion, but I think it's somewhat valid, but I'll still tell you it's my personal opinion. This won't be on the test, but it's why we learn this stuff. Number of mothers groups were complaining to the food companies saying all these things like autism and everything, your fructose in the products our kids are consuming, eating or drinking is causing this. And there was enough hue and cry or loud voices that the food company said, oh, we hear your pain. We'll cut out some of the fructose. So what do they replace it with? Sucrose. Well, when you drink or eat something, it goes in your stomach and the acid in there breaks the sucrose down to glucose and fructose. So for age of, since mankind has been consuming sugar, we've been making fructose in our body. And if that's been doing damage, like the mother groups think, I don't think so. I think the real problem is whether it's fructose or table sugar sucrose, you're consuming a lot of calories. If you're overweight, that's not good for your health and that can cause the problems. That's my personal view. But you should know sucrose breaks down your stomach to glucose and fructose. Now, why do chemical companies use fructose? Or I should say food companies? Because you have to use, you can use a lot less than sucrose because fructose is sweeter. Also, it's cheaper. And that helps maximize profits. Now, starches are polymers of glucose. What is a polymer? I'll teach you more about that today in our lab that's many of the same molecule linked together, just like box cars in a railroad train. If you've ever seen a long freight train stuck at an intersection where they have 50, 60 or more box cars, you know what I'm talking about. Now, starch 
is made up of glucose connect together. And you should know And what should you know, if you consume starch, you know, rice, potatoes are the good stuff, French fries, which I need like a hole in my head or Lay's potato chips, the sour cream and onion, my favorite, which I need like a big hole in my head. In your stomach, the hydrochloric acid and the water break it down to glucose. And this is the most abundant sugar in nature because we break starches down to glucose, which is the sugar in your blood. And that transports glucose to various parts of your body to do things that is now beyond the level of knowledge of Dr. White, because I'm a chemist, not a biologist. And you should know starch breaks down to glucose. Now, the last food group are proteins. And these are polymers or what called amino acids. Many amino acids bond together. And with proteins, if you ate, if you're not a vegan, if you had a hot dog, hamburger, bacon, or a steak, and you chewed it and swallowed it and went in your stomach, the proteins react with the hydrochloric acid in your stomach. I believe also one of your intestines, the student corrected me a couple of years ago, to make amino acids. Different ones are in different proteins. And this is what your body uses to build things like your skin, your hair, your muscles. So you should know proteins are broken down to amino acids. Oh, we're doing good today. Now, the last thing I like to talk about are steroids. And steroids are your hormones, things that control many things going on in your body. And I'm gonna be nice and say, usually I ask students to learn how to draw. This is the ring skeleton of a steroid or all your hormones. And you have a six membered ring here fuse, meaning sharing carbons here, to a six-membered ring here called the B ring, up here, a six-membered ring C, and then a five-membered ring D. And I'm counting each bend in a line for the carbons. And this is the skeleton for all your hormones steroids. And let's look at a couple. All right, thumbs up people. Do you see this big chemical structure on your screen? Thank you, Ethan. All right, this is a steroid or hormone called testosterone. And notice it has six, 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 five. Also has carbon double bond oxygen, a carbon carbon double bond. The end of this line is CH3. This tells you is that group above or below this ring, that's called stereochemistry, which I'm not gonna teach. Here you have a carbon with hydroxyl group. And this is testosterone. 
which controls many of the things in a man. And there's some in women too, but not the level in men. And another hormone is this one. This is progesterone. This is one of the female hormones. And it's very similar to testosterone, except right here at the top, instead of an OH, you have a carbon, double bond to oxygen, another carbon. This is called a ketone. And all your hormones have this 6, 6, 6, 5 ring skeleton. And there are different other hormones in our body. Uh, there's hormones that affect growth. There are hormones that affect the woman's monthly cycle and control it. And these all are organic molecules. And guess what? I have finished all the material that will be on test number four. Remember, I'm still going to do a lab today, so don't run away yet. Remember that on Monday, I'll probably do a video. We'll go through this stuff again. But on Monday, I won't be here, so I'll post the video. On Tuesday, uh, I'll probably will do the lab, and we'll also go through the organic problem set. On Wednesday next week, I'll do my world famous review for test number four. And then on Friday, you'll be taking test number four. And with that, it's time to do the lab, which I have to download from because I don't have it on this machine. I have to open up some files. All right, it's lab time. And this is lab is beyond lab, Dr. White. You don't have to go online for it. And this deals with polymers. Does everybody see Chem 1105 polymers on your screen? Thumbs up, people. Uh-oh. Now do you see it? Thank you. All right, thank you, Hamza. Now, what are polymers? Polymers are very large molecules that play an important role in our daily life. The word polymer comes from the part poly meaning many and mer meaning single unit. And these are very large molecules with repeating units. Think of a freight train. And you can have them with boxcars that are all the same or boxcars that are two or more different type. And polymers are like that. 
Now, one polymer I'd like to talk about is polyurethane polymers. And what is a polyurethane? Poly means many. Urethane is a functional group that I really hadn't talked about. And how do you make it? You take this type of molecule, is called an isocyanate, you react it with an alcohol, and this new molecule is called a urethane. Now, when you have a diisocyanate, two of that, and a polyol, poly meaning many hydroxyl OH in a molecule, you'll get a polymer called a polyurethane. Now, this reaction is very exothermic. The term exothermic means it gives off heat. Now, to make a foam, which is used, you put in a low boiling liquid in the reaction mixture, and this makes a foam. Now, what is a foam? A foam is a chemical that hardens and trap something in bubbles. You don't think about it, but how many of you have ever seen real bread? I don't know when I say real, either homemade bread or bread from a bakery, not the kind you get in the store in the plastic. Have you ever seen that and you cut into it and you see those holes in there? That's because you cut into the bubble that the bread is surrounding and the gas there is carbon dioxide made from the yeast. And you don't think of it, but bread is really a hardened foam, a solid foam, it is. Well, urethane can do the same thing. And by the way, I know a little about it. I only have five US patents in urethane technology. And that low boiling liquid is heated from the heat, the exotherm of the reaction, to form a foam. Now that foam can be rigid, solid, or flexible. Flexible urethane foam, that's the cushion in your car seat. It's also many of your pillows are flexible urethane foam. Now the rigid foam, because it traps the liquid that expands it to form bubbles is a very, very good insulator. And if you look at your refrigerator in your house right now, if it's new one purchased since 1990 or 80, the walls between the inner box and the outside are thin. <clears throat> if you were to look online or go to a junkyard, and see a refrigerator from 1940 or 1950, you'll see the walls are thick. Why? Because the old refrigerators use glass wool to insulate the inner coal box from the outside, which was very thick to get that insulation. Urethane foam is quite good insulator, so you don't need as much, and that's why newer refrigerators have thinner walls. Also, you can use that for insulating homes. Now in this lab, I'll be making a urethane foam and I'll discuss aspects of urethane foam manufacture including A and B size of the urethane foam formulation, cream time and tap free time. All right, well, I better discuss that. Now, a big use for urethane foams is either in a plant to make insulation boards or at a construction site. And the people there are not PhD chemists, are not chemists at all. And the urethane industry came up with a great idea. They have two different sides or containers. One is called the A side. And that just contains the isocyanate.
actually it's called polymeric. And the other is the B side. And that contains the polyol, the alcohol. Now it contains a blowing agent that helps make the foam. And originally those were freon blowing agents, but that destroys the ozone layer. And they've switched that to other low boiling liquids. Now there's something called a catalyst, which I told you. A catalyst makes the reaction go quicker. The more catalyst, the faster the reaction. And finally, they also add to make sure you get nice bubbles, insulation, a silicone surfactant. How do I know this? Because I've worked in this industry. That's why I have patents in this industry. And the way they made it easy is you mix equal amounts of A side and B side together to make the urethane foam. And they made that easy for people either in a factory or at a construction site building homes and insulating them. You just have to mix equal amounts and make the foam. Now, do I have time? Oh, I have time. Uh, when I was selling a new product that I developed for the urethane industry, because I'm a PhD and I also know how to talk to people, most PhDs don't, meaning going out in the road with salesmen, I would go out to help the salesman because when I'd walk into a customer being a PhD research chemist, I had credibility the salesman never had. And one quick story, we went to this good sized company in California, talked to the president about my, our company's new products. And we met in his office. And first of all, he had two 55 gallon drums in his office of their company's products. And one was labeled A side, the other B side, which is interesting, but that's not why I remember it. This was in California where sometimes people are, well, different. Behind them in these huge uh, aquariums with no water in them, I guess they call them what they call them, whatever. Each one had one as big as your hand, tarantula. <laughs> Here I'm trying to talk to them behind them, you see them slowly crawling around in there. I was so glad to get out of that office, yuck. But that's my, one of my urethane stories with tarantulas. Ugh. Now, if we were doing this in a lab, I would be showing you, or sometimes I even let students do this, in a plastic cup, you'd weigh out 10 grams of the A side. In a beaker, 10 grams of the B side. Then in a hood with newspaper underneath because urethane sticks to everything, it's very good adhesive. You pour the B side into the plastic cup with the A side and you mix real quick. Now there's something called the cream time. And this is when the color in the solution mixture turns us from a dark brown looking like coffee, black coffee, to a light cream colored brown. Looks like when you add cream to coffee, by the way, Dr. White hates coffee. I'm a tea drinker if you haven't guessed by now. And they call this the cream time. And the cream time tells you when the reaction starts. Now, to make a faster cream time, which means a smaller cream time, faster reaction, you add more catalyst. To make a faster reaction, which is a smaller cream time, you add more catalyst. And this is an important thing that you record. Now, another thing is when is the foam you're making, like a rigid foam, 
no longer sticky or tacky. And you touch that with a piece of wooden tongue depressor if we were in the lab to know when it's no longer tacky. And this is called the tack free time. Let's get rid of this commercial. Hey guys, welcome to Forward. No, goodbye. Today we're talking about molding foam. Specifically today we have a three pound per cubic foot molding foam that uh, we want to discuss some of its attributes. This material starts its life off as thin liquids. It's going to be mixed at a one-to-one -one volume measurement. Everybody and then it's going to expand. The it's going to expand to form a very lightweight foam. And as we said, in this case, it's a three pound per cubic foot density foam. So it's going to expand 24 times its liquid. Everybody see the YouTube on your screen? Thumbs up, people. Thank you. Let me play this. We're going to jump around. To create a lightweight, non-absorbing closed cell foam that can be easily sanded or carved to dimensional shape. It can be cast as backups or as free fans, free standing forms. It can be painted with automotive paint and used in conjunction with fiberglass resins. In conjunction, it can be used for flotation. It has an extremely good compressive strength. This is put in the water. To demonstrate how this liquid foam is, is going to actually be mixed and used, we first conditioned our liquids to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Best temperature to be at. Hotter means fast reaction. Colder means a slower reaction is going to create higher density foam than desired. We're going to measure out in equal portions of liquid. In this case, we've had some pre-marked beakers. We measure out part B, and now we're going to measure out part A. And then we're going to take a flat spatula, not a round dowel, and we're going to pour one into the other, and we're going to simply mix. And it's important that you quickly scrape the sides and the bottom of the uh, container to incorporate all the A and the B. So that they get fully reacted. Doesn't take much. When the material starts to react, it'll form a nice, even cream color, and you need to pour that into your mold. For this demonstration, we're just going to do a free rise uh, block of foam so that you can actually see how this material expands. We'll uh, we will get it mixed, and it's going to create just a little bit of heat on its own. Again, 72 degrees is the perfect temperature to start mixing it. It gives you about a minute or so of time to actually mix the foam and pour it into the mold. You got to be careful now not to put too much foam into a, a closed cavity mold because it does create quite a bit of pressure on its own and it could warp your mold. So now it's starting to come up. And actually to demonstrate this, we're just going to let it come up to kind of show you what we call free rise in this. So it comes out, it's going to expand. And within about two or three minutes, it's going to get to be full hardness. And we'll be able to actually pick this up, carve it, and show you how it's used. It's best not to get this on your hands, and I'm not wearing gloves, but you should wear gloves with this right now, because it loves to stick to human hands. That's about it. And you can see I only had about 500 milliliters of liquid, but you can get a sense of how much volume with this. Now, foam is sold in different densities. Some very, very well lightweight packaging foam, which is about three quarters of a pound per cubic foot density, all the way up to heavy furniture foams, which can be as high as 15 to 20 pounds per cubic foot. And every time they go up in density, the carvability and the machinability goes up to it as well. And you can see this is already forming a nice solid. And within a few more minutes, I'll be able to take this up and actually carve it for you. Notice so it's been about five minutes since we initially mixed our foam. And you can see it's pretty well set. It doesn't stick to polyethylene or propylene plastics. The common garbage bags work quite well as a barrier. As you can see, it's durable and it's fairly lightweight. And as we mentioned earlier, you see.
Now, interesting thing is that if you work in urethane foams, you can control the density by how much blowing agent you have in there. And temperature is not a good way to control how fast or your cream time catalyst is. Now, there's a, I don't know, badge of courage or not courage. Uh, uh, I can't think of the right term to use right now, but to show that you're an expert in urethane foams, you make one of these. And this is a urethane foam I made, took me three or four tries, where you put just the right amount of catalyst in the cup when you mix it, and then you pour it. And as soon as it hits the surface, of the bench top, and I had plastic underneath it, it hardens. So the cup looks like it's floating in the air. And this is my badge of honor. That's what I was looking for, that I'm an expert in urethane foams because I can make this. And this is quite rigid and it's a foam, but I made this oh, back in about 1985, wow. And that's when I was working with urethane foams. Now, that's one kind of polymer. Let's talk about another polymer. Oh, I should point out, if you were to do this in a lab, the cream time is four seconds, the tack-free time is three minutes, and yes, it did give off heat. You can feel the outside of the cup gets hot, and it's a salad and like I just showed you light brown. Now, there's another reaction to make a polymer that you can do at home. And this is reacting boric acid or 20 mule team borax with alcohols. Now, the reaction is if you take boric acid and react it with three alcohols, you'll form what's called the borate ester. And not for this, but for another use, I have a patent with borate esters, so I know them quite well. Now, in this reaction, you're gonna react two different types of alcohols and see the difference. One is isopropyl alcohol that contains only three carbons. I should also have here one OH group. Now, polyvinyl alcohol, which is, you know, as Elmer's glue, the white glue you use, contains over a million carbons and it has many over a million, many OH groups, which means for isopropyl alcohol, this is small. For the glue, this is large. And that affects its water solubility. Small things tend to be water soluble, large things are not. Now let's have some fun with this. And you can do this at home. Now in the video, they talk about putting food color in, in the lab at COD no food coloring because I don't want students going home with, even though you're wearing rubber gloves, your clothes with <laughs> colored food coloring on it. Food coloring is very dangerous to work with in terms of dyeing your clothes or making them a certain color.
and time as experts in online education. Everybody see the purple on your screen, YouTube? Hi everyone. Today I'm so excited to show you our favorite slime recipe. Thank you, Spencer. This is the most amazing, softest, gooey, oozy slime, and it's so much fun to play with. First, we will begin by creating our slime activator. You use one cup of hot water with half a teaspoon of borax. Make sure to stir it well so that you dissolve all the powder. Once you are done mixing, you can keep it to the side. If you prefer not to use the borax activator, you could also use contact lens solution that contains boric acid. Now we'll start our slime. I'm using one part of glue, so one bottle of Elmer's PVA glue, and I'm going to mix it with warm water. So I'm going to add the warm water into the glue bottle. We don't use that much Elmer's glue in the lab when we yeah, do it. Nice it top, and I'm going to shake it. That will help spread the leftover glue inside. Open it up to clean up afterwards. Just go ahead and mix it all together so that you don't. Now just go ahead and mix it all together so that you don't end up with any clumps. You want a nice smooth mixture. She's dissolving the glue in water. I tend to keep on hand a bunch of ice cream sticks because they're the easiest to clean up afterwards and they do a great job of mixing. We use tongue depressors. Then you will add your food color of choice. I choose to use food color gels because I like how vibrant the colors come out. You just need one drop. This I'm going you. today with a purple color. For some reason, it's looking a little bit bluish. I chose purple because we currently have a million different slimes at home. So we've got a butter slime that's yellow. We have two fluffy slimes that are pink and blue. You can find the recipes and video tutorials by clicking one of the links. Keep mixing until you don't have any streaks left over. Now your borax mixture would have had time to dissolve. Make sure that you give it a good mix before you start adding it in. This is really important that you add it in really slowly because this is sort of the part that's going to make or break your slime. So I tend to go and add in a teaspoon at a time and then I mix and then I can add another teaspoon at a time and mix. You will see that it starts to start sticking together. As I raise my spoon, I'll show you. Yeah, see? And I think it's better when you are adding in the borax that you don't just add it to one place because then just that area is going to get put together. Whereas if you sprinkle a little all around, then it actually a tiny bit of shaving cream smell all over you. Now you can see it's really coming together really nicely. The borax makes it more hot. You can add in between five to seven teaspoons of borax. I probably added about, I think I added six teaspoons and I could tell from the consistency with my hands that it was a little, it was still a little bit too sticky. So I went ahead and added one more, mixed again. And then now, now, And if you look at table three, when you use isopropyl alcohol, the liquid, what, when you mix that with the boric acid, it's a clear liquid. When you use the polyvinyl alcohol, the Elmer's glue, you see that we don't use food coloring, that gluey, gooey, slimy white solid. By the way, if you've ever seen things like Star Wars, and you see that goop coming out of the monster's mouth, that's that polymer. And that's today's lab, other than at the end, here's some questions for you to answer.
And that's today's Chem 1105. I was going to do something, but I've got to take care of something. Probably next week, I'll start meeting with some of you after class just to say hello. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye. But before I do, let me remind you, tomorrow, Wednesday, and Friday, there's no class because of the Thanksgiving holiday. However, I will have my office hour Wednesday afternoon. If you have any questions or you just want to stop by and say hello to Dr. White, stop by. I'll do it just from five to six. And don't forget next Monday, and I'll send out an email over the weekend announcement. I will be posting the video for next Monday's lecture because I'm not going to be here. I'm going to have my other eye cataract surgery. And with that, I'm going to say, I hope you all have a happy Thanksgiving. For those who came in late, later today, I'll be or tonight, I'll be sending out an email and changing the last four labs, not the one that's due today. Make sure you hand it in. Uh, the Thanksgiving amnesty program for the last four labs. If you haven't handed it in, this is a chance for you to hand it in now. And with that, I'm done. Gain gesund, be healthy. Goodbye. Have a happy Thanksgiving.